April 2003 gave us Backlash 2003, a show that let's all agree was pretty damn terrible, but tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do Judgment Day 2003, and this one made Backlash look like WrestleMania 17. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this. This is going to be another episode of 10 Years Ago, your favourite and my favourite series. And guess what, folks? The first of two episodes you're going to get in the month of May, you lucky, lucky people. Tonight, Judgment Day 2003, like I say, and this show, I'll warn you now, is utterly shit. Don't believe me? Look down below in the description box to just see the star ratings I'm going to be giving out for this one. Oh, yes. This one's a couple of things to talk about. First things first, it's the Legion of Doom appeared on Raw in May 2003, believe it or not, in a match with RVD and Kane. Yeah, this one was pretty terrible, uh, looking very average at best, and Hawk especially took the five-star frog splash, completely no-sold it. I guess old habits die hard. Also appearing on Raw in 2003 was the last appearance of the of the great, great, classy Freddy Blassy, as he yeah, they came to the ring to I think he was promoting his book, uh, Listen Up You Pencil Neck Geeks, which was just about to be released. And three minute warning in what as far as I know is that was their last appearance. One of their last appearances on Raw came out about to beat him up. The Dudley Boys made the save, it meant that Classy Freddy Blassie was able to utter those immortal words, Devon, get the table. Classy Freddy Blassie unfortunately died of heart and kidney failure just three weeks after this. It was his last appearance on WWE TV. A genuinely brilliant manager who was a, just a fantastic wrestler as well. He used to bite people a lot and is you know, a great part of the rock and wrestling era. Sadly missed. The show starts off. Here we go. But they're really the only bits of news. There'll be other bits of news we can talk about on the show. The show starts off with new Raw co general manager Stone Cold Steve Austin making his way to the ring. Basically, it goes like this the fake board of directors um, had appointed. Um, Stone Cold to be the co general manager uh, by Lind and Linda McMahon made this announcement. Stone Cold had been basically fired by Eric Bischoff the day after WrestleMania 19 uh, because of his um, his medical condition. You know, his, his neck was fucked, obviously, and that was done. Uh, this was nice. I mean, Austin had reinstated the Intercontinental Championship, which we'll talk about later on, and he'd made a match between um, Chief Morley and Jerry the King Lawler. Whoever, you know, if 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 Jerry the King Lawler won. Um, Jim Ross will be reinstated or rehired or one of those things. And that's exactly what happened, which means that we don't have to put with Coach on this show, which is lovely. Austin comes out and basically you know, cut, you know, eats up five minutes of pay-per-view time by saying that he's going to watch the show in a skybox, which, while nice, is also utterly pointless, which is lovely. Uh, he drinks beer with Taz and then makes his way up to the skybox. I mean, he's like, yeah, I've paid to see this. Fuck watching wrestling and wrestling pay-per-view. That'd just be silly. Now, our opening contest saw John Cena, Chuck Palumbo, and Johnny the Bull Stamboli, two members of the FBI there, the full-blooded Italians, defeating Chris Benoit, Rhino, and Spunky in a crap opener in the first of our dud matches of the evening. There'll be more. Trust me on that one. Cena cuts an awful, awful rap. It's funny. It's funny, right? I liked the rapper character. Genuinely. Looking back on his raps, they are so rubbish. I really are. Uh, this contest, a six-man tag match on a pay-per-view in the opening slot. Have a guess how long this one went, because I guarantee you'll be so wrong. Because this one, yeah, went three minutes and 55 seconds. Not even four minutes. More so, John Cena didn't do anything in this match other than get German suplex once by Chris Benoit. That was his whole participation. The only good thing in this match, right, the only thing was a highlight, there was a, sorry, a dive to the outside at the very, very start of the match by Spanky. That was it. The only thing, right, and that was for, yeah, that was completely null and void by the fact that Spanky goes to slice bread, but Palumbo counters, allowing Stamboli to hit the kiss of death for the win. And he, you know, that knocked Spanky out, knocked him out cold. He comes round after the match looking like he doesn't know where the fuck he is, and he's bleeding, and it's like, wow, that was obviously effective, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, yeah, crap and pointless match. Cheers for that opening well. In the Skybox, Stone Cold Steve Austin's munching on hot dogs and drinking beer when Bischoff comes up and they start talking about everything's 50-50 on Raw. So it's his Skybox as well, which 
leads Austin to want to make him drink. So he drinks a beer and has a hot dog and everything. La Resistance defeating Tess and Scott Steiner in a poor, poor match. La Resistance debuted on Raw three weeks earlier. This it was a Reddy Dupree and Sylvan Granier. Sylvan Granier, of course, was the dodgy referee from No Way Out. They attacked Steiner. So at least we have a reason for this match, if nothing else. Stacy um, um, had been saved from beats last time out by uh, Steiner, I'm sure you remember at Backlash. And Test is still not very happy about this. And yeah, Stacy spends more time cheering um, Scott than Test. Incidentally, I saw Rene Dupree last year at a PCW show. He had an awfully shite match with um, Max Angelis. Max Angelis, bless his heart, tried so hard in this match. Yeah, I feel sorry for him because he's never been back to PCW since. And it, bo- it bothers me that there's a chance that the PCW crowd or bookers thought that Max Angelis, well, he's shit, isn't he? But yeah, Rene Dupree, all his fault. Looked like he wasn't interested in being there at all. This match is okay. I mean, when I say okay, okay is really stretching it fine. There's nothing special in this one. The best bit is the miscommunication as Tesco to Big Boot Grenier and hits Scott Steiner and it looks like this Big Boot hits him full force in the face. That's lovely. Um, La Resistant throw Test really gently into the ring post and then hit a double flat jump on Steiner to get the win. Post-match Stacy checks on Scott but Test drags her off. She goes, and goes back to Scott and Test drags her off again and it's like oh good. So basically what you've got here is storyline advancement and I get that but do you not think on their first pay-per-view match that La Resistance should really battered them instead of getting a, what was presented as a fluke win because of face miscommunication? Oh, well. I don't give a fuck about um, La Resistance one bit. In the back, Ace reporter Gregory Helms thinks Mr. America, who we'll talk about later on, don't get me wrong, is Hulk Hogan, while Mr. American... Mr. America, excuse me, believes that Helms is the hurricane. Way! Lovely. <laughs> I have in my notes. Hilarious. This isn't. <laughs> then Josh Matthews talks to Eddie Guerrero. Charbo Guerrero had suffered a torn bicep injury at the SmackDown tapings, you know, a couple of days before this. So basically, Eddie Guerrero, who of course is meant to be teaming with Charbo to take on Team Angle next up in a ladder match, has got through two choices. He can either forfeit the match or it can be a handicap match. But Eddie's clever, you see. He thinks of a third one, which he can find another tag team partner who's going to pick well who else would he pick obviously he picks Tajiri and we get a legitimately funny thing because Eddie says to Tajiri yeah I've been teaching you the family motto what's the family motto and Tajiri goes we lie we cheat we steal essay and it's you know that doesn't do it justice guarantee it legitimately funny stuff I like that a lot so Eddie Guerrero and Tajiri defeating Team Angle in an okay and it's the best match of the night ladder match um, what did I see? What did I say about the fucking picture? What did I say at Backlash, yeah? About the picture, the, the p- massive picture of Kurt Angle, yeah? What happened at the SmackDown tapings, the show before this, yeah? It was smashed over Shelton Benjamin's head. Wrestling 101. Prop gets smashed. It always happens. It should have just happened at Backlash, is what I've said. But let me tell you about this one. I'm going to talk you through this one, actually, because it's the best match of the night. Yeah, obviously, we'll talk about Kevin Nash later on, but yeah, we'll go through this one. So... The champs hit some nice double team moves, including a double gut buster. They go to retrieve a ladder from under the ring. Tajiri attempts to dive onto them, which just looks woefully poor. He seems to go for a dive, and then imagine, yeah, he's going for a dive, yeah, and then just goes, plummets down head first to the outside, like, oh, oh. Um, Eddie tries a plancher, but is swatted aside. Team Angle tries to climb, but Tajiri hits a nice handspring elbow to the ladder to stop them. The challengers then baseball slide a ladder into Charlie Haas's testicles. And the look on his face, yeah, is fantastic. Genuinely wonderful. They then put him between two ladders, and Eddie hits a springboard splash onto him. Nasty stuff. Tajiri climbs, but gets stopped by Shelton. He climbs, but is stopped by Eddie, who then gets revenged by power slamming him onto the ladder. Why not? Why the hell not? Team Angle put Tajiri into, onto the ladder and hit a broken arrow onto him. Sorry, the broken arrow, which is where they hold him up and sorry, Charlie Hart holds him up. Shelton does a springboard over them onto the back. If you don't know what the broken arrow is, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was, just, uh, just you know, some of you might. Some of you might. 
T-Mango put Tajiri onto the ladder. And I've just said that prick. Hassan climbs, but Eddie sends him to that side. Eddie is whipped into a ladder into the corner by Shelton, and the crowd don't give a fuck in the slightest. This is a very, very quiet crowd in this one. I'm sorry, I've got shooting pains in my arm here. Really hurting. Couple of nice kicks by Tajiri, followed by some ladder shots, and a weak as shit baseball side onto a ladder onto Shelton's face. Tranchula fell. Hass is broken by a ladder shot by Shelton. Eddie monkey flips Shelton into the ladder, which looks horrible. <laughs> just Ugh. He climbs but chooses to hit a frog splash on Shelton, which I have never, ever understood, right? Here you are. There's what you want. There are the tag team towers. So I'm going to climb. And I'm climbing slowly like you have to do in a ladder match because I'm so hurt. And I could reach and grab the belts, but wait. Shelton Benjamin's there. And he's in, uh, no. but Shelton's in uh, the belt. The, but he's in the prone position for the frog splash. And I could win the match, but I don't want to. Why do the frog splash? It doesn't make any sense. Even in the quasi make believe, you know, detached from reality storyline world that is WWE, it just in my mind does not make any sense whatsoever. <sighs> Eddie and Charlie climb, but Eddie hits a sloppy sunset flip bomb, and Eddie tries to climb again. But Shelton is right behind him. Tajiri then climbs up the other side of the ladder and hits Dream Mist through the ladder on him, which is quite a nice little thing, enabling him to get at hand and Eddie to get the belt. I remember this match being so good. I've got this show on VHS in there. I remember this one being so brilliant. Yeah, watching it back now, you think to yourself, "This is a sloppy mess, and it's got nothing in it." While there is some good stuff in it. The uh, baseball side into the ladder, for example, is quite, quite, I mean, the baseball side with the ladder into Charlie Haas's testicle, sorry, is good. It's, there's nothing that you haven't seen before in ladder matches in this match. It's just, uh, it's just, it's just there, as some guy once said. It's just, it's, it's, it's nothing special at all. Unfortunately, and I mean that genuinely, it's the best match of the whole show. Two stars. What does that say? What does that say? In the skybox, Bischoff and Austin continue to, continue to eat and drink, which is lovely. Bischoff sips a bit. He sips it. It's out to you because, because of course, in, in 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 America, I'm guessing the real way you drink a beer is to crack it open and just go gog 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 gog, while half of it goes, sorry, three quarters of it goes down your chest and only a quarter of it goes in. Bischoff sips it. I don't under. I understand that. He, Austin thinks he's a pussy for it, but that's the way you drink a beer, isn't it? Isn't it? Or am I just am I just being British here? And yeah, we, we the way we sip our tea with Pinky. Am I just am I, am I thinking that, that that's that's the way that you that's that's I don't get this at all. In the back, Piper and Jericho have an entertaining confrontation. You may remember this, and this is a, where after uh, Piper pulled off Zach Gowan's leg, which we'll talk about later. Jericho says <laughs> Jericho says to him, "What did you do with that leg? Did you eat it?" Yeah, that's the confrontation. That's entertaining. It doesn't go anywhere. doesn't do anything for either man, but that bit made me laugh. And then Christian won a battle royale to become the new Intercontinental Champion in another dud match. Pat Patterson comes out to present the... Yeah, whoever wins will get presented with a belt by Pat Patterson. All participants are former Intercontinental Champions. We bring out Val Venus, who was Chief Morley a month before, but is now Val Venus. Chris Jericho, Goldust, Landstorm, RVD, Christian Test, Kane... And Booker T. Now, I don't get why Booker T is out here. He's not a former IC champion. That doesn't make sense. Incidentally, um, both Bo or Bo Booker's, Kane's, and RVD's music have been dubbed over here, which is quite interesting. Um, don't know why, but um, yeah, it's um, it's great to see Test again. Isn't that nice? Seeing him for the second time in the night. Um, right, Kane is eliminated early on. He comes back in, hits choke slams on Test, Val, and RVD, right? After two minutes, there are Four men left. And this is the, one of the problems with this match. I do not understand why they couldn't have a mini tournament with those four men, yeah, and have the winner of that tournament be crowned the IC champion. They did it with the United States Championship in two months' time. Why have a battle royale yet? I just do not understand it at all. I just do not get it. There's a bit I like in this in this match where Booker T eliminates Gold Dust, yeah, and Gold Dust sort of, yeah, because they acknowledge that they're friends, yeah, so Gold Dust sort of just shrugs it off. Yeah, Booker T's like, and he's like, yeah, okay, you got me well done. That's good. What I don't like in this one is the fucking awful finish. The referee gets bumped, if you can believe that. In a battle royale, the referee gets bumped. Bumped, for fuck's sake. 
Yeah, Booker T tosses out Christian and wins clean, but the referee didn't see it because been bummed. Christian, realising this has happened, goes and yanks the IC title belt off pa 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 Patterson, whacks Christian with it, and then eliminates Christian just as the referee come, you know, comes around. You're like, oh, man, what a shit match this has been, and what a shitty, shitty, shitty finish. I mean, like I just said, crazy idea. Four people left after two minutes. Two minutes of action gone. All these people that he brought back. Fuck them off. Not interested. Why would I, you know, do I actually think that Lance Storm has got any chance of winning the belt at all? Not in the slightest. Also, right, also, I've got to say, crap finish, like I say. Also, though, Booker T was made to look like a complete jobber at WrestleMania, wasn't he? And then once again, Booker T is made to look like a complete idiot here. You've got a feel for the guy. You really have, because it's just like, really? Why do you even bother, man? Why do you even bother? That was our, was that our second or third of the night? So, our, how many matches have we had? Um, oh, no, sorry. We had a dud and a half star. And then I gave the, the ladder match two stars. But this was a straight up dud. Speaking of straight up duds, Tory Wilson defeating Tate Sable in a bikini contest. Oh, yeah, this one gets a dud. Oh, yeah. Sable had been obsessed with Tory since her uh, return to the WWE, which I talked about last month. And uh, you, you can sue someone for sexual harassment, but if you've made the company money before, Vince will go, hey, come back. Why not? Uh, she hosted the Sable Invitational Bikini Contest. Tori was the last diva to enter, was attacked by the other divas. Thus, we have this. This should be a segment on SmackDown. Should not be on pay-per-view. Lillian Garcia sings Tori to the entrance. I mean, do you know what's really annoying about this? I sing along with Tori's music because I know all the words to it. And afterwards, I turn to my missus and go, how do I know the words to that? And she looks, gives, gives me that look that I'm the Fuck should I know? I don't give a shit about anything like this, you know. <laughs> anyway, right, what bugs me about this, and one of the reasons why it's a dud, right? Oh, I'm over in the window because I'm too hot. Not nice. Um, can I just point out, it's uh, quarter to three in the morning over here in England when I'm doing this vid because I really want to get it up there for you guys. It's not nice of me. Yeah, basically Taz is judging this. When you think King will be doing it, but it's Smackdown, so Taz is doing it, right? And Taz says that each girl will get 15 seconds to dance for you. So Sable goes first and she dances and she looks good, is what I'm going to say. She doesn't... Oh, it's hard to describe. She looks classy in, 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 his, in his ways. Dancing provocatively can look classy, right? The thing is, yeah, Taz says 15 seconds. Now, bear that in mind. Each girl will get 15 seconds to dance. Guess how long? Come on, have a guess. Nowhere near. You're not even close. 64 seconds. I timed it for you. 64 seconds Sable dances for. Ha, 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 ha. Tori then dances for how long, Draken? Draken 64 seconds? Because she gets very man, she gets 15. 15 seconds. Nope, you're wrong. She dances for 65 seconds. So she gets one more second. Shut up, Taz, and go away. Now, the thing is, as I've just said, in for my money, Sable is the better looking one by a man. Not better looking like better looking, but she dances better. And yeah, her outfit's better, in my opinion. And the audience. Completely disagree with me, of course, because they do that. Um, the thing is, Tori then takes off, like, she's wearing, basically wearing two bras and two bottoms. She takes one of the one and top ones off, which is lovely. And, Tor and King looks like he's going to have a heart attack 10 years ago, sort of thing. It's like, God, how much of a dirty old man do you look like, King? Fucking hey, go away, please. Really is. Tori then says um, she hopes there's no hard feelings and kisses Sable. And I paid for this twice. Well, I didn't because it was free over here in the UK. So I paid for it once because I bought it on VHS. In the skybox, Austin gets Bischoff to eat some jalapenos. These skits, right? What I will say about these skits, right? Is while utterly, utterly pointless. And they don't go anywhere. Trust me. There's no reason for them. They show that there is some natural chemistry between Bischoff and Austin. Is it next month at Bad Blood we get the... Um, they do, is it a three challenges thing? We're going to get to see Bischoff get a Bronco Buster, my mate Young. Is, is that the one? Is that where this one's leading to? I've just remembered that. I haven't, honestly, I swear, on my heart, it's not on my notes, but it's the, oh, oh, that's where this is going, isn't it? Backstage, Vince is convinced that Piper will unmask Mr. America. And then, Mr. America defeating Rowdy Roddy Piper in a truly awful match. And this is the match that you may have seen on Facebook, what I put. This is the match, yeah, which gets a minus star rating. When was the last time I gave something a minus star rating? I mean, it has been a long time. Maybe I've just been feeling 
extra generous this last few years. But <laughs> maybe, but I mean, come on, minor stars. Right, sorry, so I could tell you about this backstory here. I could tell you all about the backstory. I could tell you about Mr. America, about Hulk Hogan basically being fired or whatever. And been told. He had such an ironclad contract that Vince McMahon basically said, it, I'll, I'll, I'll see out your contract, we ain't performing here again. You can sit at home, and I'll pay you to sit at home. So next week, Mr. America turns up. Blah, blah, blah. Piper's pit. Blah, blah, blah. Hogan's getting owned. You know, Hogan gave his... I'm sorry, Mr. America gave his flag to some kid in the in the, in the in the front row. Piper's pit, owned by Sean O'Hare, Rowdy Roddy Piper. The kid comes in, starts attacking them, gets his leg pulled off, blah, blah, blah. Go and find it for yourself. I'm so uninterested in this match. Incredible to think that, you know, this is 20 years since they were main eventing in 1985, 90, you know, 98, and shit like that. It's amazing to think that they were main eventing 10 years before this. You know, in WCW in 1996, they were main eventing. This match is genuinely shit. And the only thing of note in this match, right? It's seriously, it's that bad. I don't even want to talk about it. It's that sort of match. The only thing that's good in this match. Oh, no, it's not even good. It's not even good, right? Mr. America isn't Hulk Hogan, all right? Let's just say, for argument's sake, we'll just kill this one dead. Mr. America isn't Hulk Hogan, right? At one point, <coughs> excuse me. He gets up on the cut on the turnbuckles and does a ten count, ten punch, yeah? And then do you know what he does? Lifts his mask up and goes, Shh. Obviously Hulk Hogan pulls the mask down, carries on with the match. And you're like, you're a fucking moron. You're an absolute moron. The only thing I want to talk about this, yeah, on leg drop gets the win, bloody blah, blah, blah. The only thing about this one that I really want to talk about, right, is this. Hogan realised a couple of weeks later that the Mr. American gig was going absolutely nowhere. He wasn't going to win the champion. He wasn't going to get the championship back. So he quit, right? Fair enough. Off he goes. Rowdy Brody Piper, on the other hand, went on a radio show, I think it was, and talked about drug use in wrestling and was fired pretty much as soon as he went on the air, right? So he was gone. Who fucking lost out on this one? Yeah, sure know her. Remember what we talked about at Backlash, that he had this great gimmick that was, you know, turned to nothing because of Rowdy Brody Piper. Rowdy Brody Piper is fired by the company. Who's, who's, who's the one who says the big fault? Sean sure O'Hare. Sean O'Hare's career never, ever recovered from it. Ever he was gone within within a year and has you know completely gone from the business. You're completely gone. You've got a feel for him. You know, Zach Gowan turned the you know good uh, turned the negative into a positive, I suppose. But I think yeah, you know, I've got a feeling that vengeance, which is coming up in a couple of months' time, I'm sure it's Zach Gowan versus Mr. America. Don't you want to see that? Um, in the back, Triple H bumps into Stephanie and Shaq's all vulnerable and tells them to be careful, Hunter. And you're like, fuck off. You two divorced a year ago. Why are you doing this? And then, and then, Kevin Nash defeated Triple H via disqualification. This one's another dud, by the way. So the build to this was actually all right. They were brawling all around the arena. I say brawling and running and all that. Kevin Nash was briskly walking around the arena because he can't run. They advertised that Ric Flair will be in Triple H's corner. Shawn Michaels will be in Kevin Nash's corner. And what do they do in the first minute of the match? They brawl to the back. Fucking yes, I hope you didn't pay for this show to see those men. And of course, you know what this means, ladies and gentlemen, for the second match and the second show even in a row. How many bumps? How many bumps will Kevin Nash take? I, on my notes, right there, I'm going with four. Four bumps. <laughs> Silly mark. Shall we go through this one? <laughs> shall we, shall we, shall we? Um, oh my god, do you know what Jim Ross does in the start of this match, right? He calls, he says, in my opinion, the World Heavyweight Championship is the richest prize in the game. Oh, Jim, a title that had been created out of thin air less than a year ago is the richest prize in the game. We're over in SmackDown, you've got the WWE Championship that was created in 1960. Oh, Oh, this is shit that I just can't do as a commentator. If I was told by GPW, right, what I want you to do, I want you to say that this champion, I want you to say that this bottle of Pepsi Max, yeah, is the greatest bottle of Pepsi Max that there ever has been, right? When, oh God, that wasn't a good example. When this fruit loaf has been here for 15 years, I couldn't, that's a terrible example. I'm sorry, that's awful. What could we use? What could we, ketchup? Ketchup, 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 no, fuck it, food analogies aren't working, right, you, you know what I mean, when he says that, I just, 
my brain falls out. You're like, shut up, please. You can't believe what you're saying. You just can't, because it's utter fiction. Should we go through this one? Ah, Nash controls at the start with a big back body drop, a big boot, and three, three, you evil fuck. Three elbow drops. Triple H rakes the eyes and shoves the referee down, but Earl won't disqualify, disqualify him. Nash comes back to the clothesline, but Triple H is able to hit a neck breaker. It's for nothing, though, as Nash hits a clothesline. He shoves the referee down, but no excuse for him either, because, well, Earl's fair. If nothing else, you push me. I'm not going to disqualify you. You push me, so I'm not going to disqualify you either. Happy days. Ref um, get bumped. <laughs> referee gets bumped. That's three times the referee's been knocked on his ass, by the way. <laughs> so Triple H goes low. Does that count as a bump? I'm saying no, because to me, a bump is a flat back bump or a finishing move or something like that. Getting low blowed, no. Also, no, is getting rammed into an exposed turnbuckle. We'll come back to that in a second. I just, I think I've got ahead of myself. Um, yeah, Triple H removes a turnbuckle pad, but Nash hits a sidewalk slam and then another big boot, shoot, pro proving once and for all, yeah, that Kevin Nash's moveset is just non-existent. He can hit elbows, a big back draw drop. Big boots and the jackknife, and that's about it. And if a match has to go any length, I mean, this one goes... Does it say how long this one goes? Actually, it doesn't say how long this one goes. I'm sorry, I haven't written it down, but it goes pretty long because it's a Triple H match. So he goes through his entire move set, then realises he hasn't got anything left, so has to go through his entire move set again. So, yeah, there's the big boot <laughs> again. I get so much heat from certain certain individuals who miss so much ripping on Nash. It's funny. It's funny. Um... Uh, he goes for snake eyes. Earl tries to, you know, on the exposed turnbuckle. Earl tries to shove him. What does Nash do? <laughs> Shoves him out of the way. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, that allows Triple H to gain control and ram Nash into the exposed turnbuckle. This is what I'm talking about. That's not a bump, in my opinion. But, do you know what is a bump? Yeah, a pedigree. That's two. Oh, yes. But it only gets two. Oh, no. Um, Nash recovers with Cena-esque speed and bumps Triple H to the outside. He gets out his phallic hammer. Earl tries to stop him, gets the hammer rammed into his shoulder, which incidentally not only causes the disqualification, which gets the win for Nash, but a legitimate injury. Now, this is interesting. It's a rubber hammer. How the fuck did it injure But he got a legitimate shoulder injury off this one. That's interesting. Uh, Nash gets a third, third big boot. Snake eyes onto the turnbuckle and the jackknife power. Triple H is then helped to the back, but Nash knocks down all the people who came up to help him, all the referees and that. And then out comes Ric Flair. He gets knocked down. Out comes Shawn Michaels to try and stop him from doing whatever it is he's about to do. He gets knocked down and a jackknife powerbomb through the announce, the raw announcer, the other one at the very top of the engines, you know, round, gets the win. So, what did you have on the how many bumps will Kevin Nash sweepstake? If you had four like me, you were way off. You were way, way off. He took two bumps. This match was utter shit. I mean, every shape on form it could be it is shit. Nash showed what a limited worker he was by this time. He has nothing. He has nothing at all. He spends more time in this match doing this. He do something and then does this. Everything he does, everything. Everything. It's shit. Utter shit. And you know, we've got to do have another two of these. We've got a street fight coming in with instruction and a hell in a cell match. My god, we have to put up with more. In the skybox, because um Because why does he do this? Oh, because he had the jalapenos, that's right. Bischoff throws up, which is hilarious. And Austin cleans him up with some beer. Yay! And then Jazz defeating um Jackie. Trish and Victoria in an okay match to retain the women's championship. Classic camel toe from Jackie, if you are a bit weird like I am. First thing you spot when Jackie's making a ring, like, bloody Christ, look at that, put some pants on, girl. Damn. Not bad, not great. It's hard to follow at times. There's some good action in there, I suppose. There's a bit where there's a double submission going on as Jazz, 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 whatever, locks Trish Stratus in an STF while Jackie puts Victoria in a nice single leg crab. There's a nasty moment, really nasty, it's nasty, not in a, in a bad way, as um, Trish goes for strategy action on Victoria. And Victoria, and you know the way how Trish bounces up onto the ropes? As she goes through that, Victoria just grabs her and launches her over the top and she comes down face first, busts, busts the lip open, that's nice. Um, the other thing that's good in this one is the, uh, the DDT 
see that Jazz uses to get the win. It was good match. It was an all right match. It wasn't a great match. I'll tell you something. What this match just left glaring of us was this division needed some fresh blood because it was like, really, these guys again, really? So after a show full of utter bullshit, you start waiting for the main event and it's Big Show defeating, sorry, Brock Lesnar defeating the Big Show. <laughs> Brock Lesnar defeating the Big Show in an all right stretch of match to retain the WWE Championship. Like I say, you can probably imagine how I'm feeling at this one. It's just like, for me, it's one of those, can we end this one now, please? I want to go home, sort of thing. Um, and never ever watch it again and think to myself, why did I buy this on VHS? Why? The match was okay. The third round goes 17 minutes, and the first 10 minutes of that are just stretcher hits. There is nothing of note at all. Um, in the middle of the match, Brock leaves and you scratch your head. You're like, where the fuck is this idiot going? But then Rey Mysterio comes out. Now, you may remember this whole thing started because of Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio got whacked into the ring post by Big Show at Backlash. That settled this match. The whole thing was to set up this match. Rey Mysterio could cut, cut an emotional promo on SmackDown where he said, you know, he, he didn't think he'd be able to get in the ring again. Something like that. Excuse me, Michael. Oh, Michael Collard said to him, "Do you think you'll be able to ever you you would ever get in the ring with Big Saw again?" And he said, "Right this minute, I don't know, man." At that exact moment, Big Saw appeared and tossed him around a bit. So you're like, "This is it. This is Ray getting his revenge on." No, it's not. It's not at all. He has a six one nine on the Big Saw. Big Saw naturally completely no sells it, and then he bounces off the ropes, and you don't know what he's going to do. But Big Saw just swats him down with the clothesline as they get the fuck down like the little job of bitch that you are. Rey Mysterio, all oh, treated like shit. So he actually never got his revenge. There's no payoff here at all. There is nothing. But Brock Lesnar comes back with a forklift truck. He then launches himself off it onto the Big Show with a clothesline, hits a vertical suplex, which is an impressive spot on the Big Show, and then botches an, F <laughs> botches an F5. It's like as he spins in midair, he, uh, he basically turns it into a spinning F you. And it doesn't look very nice at all. And then rolls uh, rolls Big Slow onto the forklift truck and crosses the line, because that's how you win a stretch match, you know that, to get the win. Okay, match, nothing special. Like I say, you have to feel so sorry for Rey Mysterio, because he really was just, he was used. Used with a capital U-S-E-N-D. And, you know, just, oh, man. If he did on, if he got his revenge on SmackDown, I suppose, I, I don't remember it, but I suppose that makes sense. But come on, he was just treated so badly here that you have to feel so sorry for him. Up with the worst WWE pay-per-views I've ever seen is the truth on this one. So very bad. One good match, and that even isn't even very good. There isn't anything above two stars in this in this whole show. And there are, what, five duds? Five matches are duds or worse, it says on my notes. But I don't remember five matches being duds. Let's go through some ratings, shall we? Go to the very, very top of the notes. So the first match is a dud. Obviously, there's one. And then half a star. Um, and then the last match is two. So one, the battle royale is a dud, yeah? Two. Bikini Contest is a dud. Oh, yeah, Mr. America vs. Mario Piper is minus. So that's obviously more than, worse than a dud. And Nash vs. Triple H is a dud. Five matches of an eight-match card are useless and not even worth watching. If you really feel like you must, go and watch the ladder match. But trust me on this one. You will not see anything on that in that match that you have not seen before. Trust me on that. I am such a nice guy, right? I'm going to give this one a 1 out of 10. But seriously, it's a 0.5. I'm going to give it a nice round figure, but it is a 0.5 out of 10. Avoid this show like the proverbial plague. Now, the next time we're going to be doing a 10 years ago episode, we're going to be over here in jolly old England, as American people seem to call it for some reason. I don't know. We're not very jolly over here, are we? We're all miserable fuckers. It rains so often. But anyway, we're going to do Insurrection 2003. Now, I could be wrong on this one, but I seem to remember that this was the last ever pay-per-view that we had over here in England. I may be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm not, but I, that's what I seem to remember. You lucky people, two episodes of 10 years ago in one month. What did you think of Judgment Day 2003? Am I talking utter shit? Did you think that this was one of the best pay-per-views you've ever seen? I'd love to know in the comments section below. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe, hit that like, and uh, yeah, this has been Judgment Day 2003, another episode of 10 years ago in the bag. I am literally, as far as I'm concerned, I will never ever watch this pay-per-view ever again. That's how good it is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed making it for you, and I'll see you all very soon. Take it easy, guys. Bye-bye.